Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm particularly excited for this one because it is on the monthly weather review, which started at NOAA before moving on. So today's seminar uh, is on the monthly weather review, the oldest continuously published meteorological journal in the world and publishing its 150th volume in 2022. So uh, first, some logistics. You are all as an attendee muted and there is no chat function. So if you do have questions, please place them in the question panel. We are recording this seminar. So if you leave a comment or question, we will be recording your name and your email and that question or comment to be shared with the speakers at the end of the presentation. We are also recording this and posting it up on the library's YouTube channel. So if you have to step away or if you would like to share this with a colleague, you can find it there after the fact. Uh, and with that, I'm going to introduce our speakers today. First is Professor David Schultz. He's the monthly weather review chief editor, born in Pittsburgh. Ooh, I totally butchered Pittsburgh. Born in Pittsburgh with degrees from MIT, University of Washington, and SUNY Alabama. Alabama. Ooh, today is a rough oh, day. Oh, no, that's Albany. <laughs> SUNY Albany. He has been at the University of Manchester since 2009. He wrote Eloquent Science, a Practical Guide to Becoming a Better Writer, Speaker, and Atmospheric Scientist. We should probably have you come on and speak about that book also. Uh, next, we have Sean Potter, who is a meteorologist and weather historian whose career includes work for ABC News, WeatherWise, and the National Weather Service. He holds AMS certifications in both consulting and broadcast meteorology and is the author of Too Near for Dreams, the story of Cleveland Ab Abbey, America's first weather forecaster. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dave to kick us off. Thank you, Katie. As, as Katie mentioned next year, Monthly Weather Review is going to publish its 150th volume. And despite this very long existence, we've never seen the history of this journal being well documented at all, even down to such simple questions as who the editors were for much of its early history. So to celebrate its 150th volume, Monthly Weather Review is going to publish a historical review in its January 2022 issue. It was a fascinating story to tell and it brought Sean and I together and and we learned so much in pulling it together and we're pleased to tell you just a very small part of, of this story today. Um, so for the full story, check out our article in, in January. Now, as you probably know, the U.S. Weather Service came into existence with the passage of a joint resolution of Congress in February 1870, and it authorized the Secretary of War to take meteorological observations at military posts around the country and use the telegraph to give warning of approaching storms across the country. The service, the Weather Service, initially fell under the auspices of the U.S. Army Signal Service, and uh, there was a need to present this brief history of the weather and storms across the US as quickly as possible after the weather um, happened, as, as this quote indicates on the screen. The first uh, monthly weather review was prepared by Cleveland Abbey at the end of January 1873, and subsequent issues with dates in 1872 were constructed retrospectively to fill out the um, governmental fiscal year that starts in, in January, in, in sorry, July 1872. So as you can see, the first issue on the screen here is two pages. One page is a narrative sketch of the weather conditions, and the other page is this one chart that was produced later that de uh, depicts the tracks of low pressure systems um, traveling across the U.S. during that month. Now, over time, and sometimes erratically, it grew into the scientific journal that we are accustomed to seeing today. And, and part of our review is going to be um, discussing uh, this path from uh, weather summary to uh, scientific journal. And, and this was another part of the history that Cleveland Abbey was instrumental in. 
Now, Monthly Weather Review is, is just one of the longest running continuously published journals in the world for meteorology. And it's had three different publishers. First, as we mentioned, with the Signal Service, then transferred to the civilian government agency, the Weather Bureau, which was later subsumed under um, different organizations within the Department of Commerce, ESSA, and, and eventually NOAA. Then in 1974, it was transferred from the government to the American Meteorological Society, the AMS, and this was due in part to a suite of cost-cutting cost measures in NOAA at the time. And uh, as chief editor of Monthly Weather Review since 2008 and, and with a service to the journal before that, I've been wanting to write the history of uh, Monthly Weather Review for a long time, and its 150th anniversary gave me the perfect opportunity. And so, coupled with Sean's expertise in the history of meteorology and Cleveland Abbey around this time, uh, we made a great team in pulling this article together. It's been a real pleasure to work with him. Um, it'll be published, as I said, in the January 2022 issue, um, and this will be this new department called Historical Review which was designed specifically for this article. So what we want to do in this talk is give a brief overview of some of the work that we did to pull together the history of Monthly Weather Review and then give you an opportunity to test your knowledge of Monthly Weather Review and weather history with a quiz at the end. So what we did was we looked through 149 years of Monthly Weather Review history and tried to identify the grouping of the different types of articles, data sets, weather charts that were included, and, and that led to this timeline. Now, if you look at the types of content that Monthly Weather Review published, the transition from monthly weather, weather summaries and, and charts to this scientific journal wasn't really a straightforward process. It, it comes and goes. It was punctuated by these three periods that one of the former editors, Harold Corzine, called data periods. And, and this was where the journal was primarily presenting charts, maps, and written summaries about the monthly weather with fewer or none, uh, no scientific articles in, inside. Now, the last time that, that we went through this data period was in 1949, and the only remnant of kind of a monthly weather summary that continued was this article called Weather and Circulation of whatever whatever month that was. And, and then that continued into the AMS era to February 1982 when it was finally discontinued and, and became fully um, engrossed in a, as a scientific journal. Now, these are two graphs, the number of pages that were published in Monthly Weather Review by year and the number of articles in each volume and you can see lots of variations over time obviously a lot of detail here but let's just look at a few of the large scale trends first the the periods of growth there was um, the expansion of content in the early era um, then cleveland abbey came on board as editor he was very instrumental in adding all these articles more scientific content growing the journal um, there was a period of rebirth in the 1950s after the war, 1960s, um, that included, uh, that, that required the support of, of people like Harry Wexler and um, James Caskey, who was the longest serving editor of Monthly Weather Review from 1948 to 1968. And, and they helped basically bring the journal to, to something that looks more like its modern format. And then, of course, there was the period of growth when the AMS took over, and, and, and um, I guess in some sense that, that period of growth is, is still going on, if, if, depending on how you want to look at it. Now, ironically, <laughs> it also had its down periods as well, mostly due to budget pressures, and, and you can see that these periods of budget pressures were all occurring during the period when Monthly Weather Review was part of the Weather Bureau. And, in, in part, that's what allowed the, the journal to, to become more stable, was um, being uh, taken over by the AMS and then page charges paying the way of every single article that was published. And, and hence, um, there were no budget pressures anymore because the journal would expand or contract 
based on however many articles there were. And you can even see here on a much smaller scale when you look at very specific cost-cutting measures that affected the length or the size or the thickness of um, individual monthly weather review issues, um, we can see this interesting 10-year cycle of government cost-cutting that led to repeated trimming back of the journal. Um, and But like I said, once under the AMS ownership, um, that the journal was allowed to grow um, in an unbounded way. So let me hand it over to Sean, and he'll take you through some of the history. All right, thanks, Dave. Uh, yeah, let's um, let's talk a little bit about the history. As Dave mentioned, this started out in a very uh, modest fashion as just a one-page narrative summary of uh, the month's weather for that particular uh, issue, if you even want to call the initial uh, iterations of it issues. It wasn't really uh, bound up for until several years later, and it wasn't even uh, given uh, volume numbers until about a dozen or so years after the initial um, issuance of it. Uh, but if we go on to the, and here's a, a nice sampling of uh, covers, as you can see over the years. Uh, Dave, those are from Dave's personal collection. And, and it's a really interesting just to even see um, how that has changed and over the years and how it has remained the same essentially uh, over the past uh, several decades, the, the cover at least. So there's a sort of iconic, um, a look and feel to um, well to all the AMS journals, but since AMS took over and that that classic uh, blue cover with the um, the block there. All right, let's go on to the next slide and um, talk a little bit about um, about Cleveland Abbey, who was um, was one of the early editors. As Dave mentioned, he was instrumental in helping uh, helping found the uh, the journal and get it off the ground, along with uh, uh, others at the Signal Office in Washington, uh, which is uh, and the Signal service um, which is the precursor of today's national weather service and um, he's actually was uh, uh, the time of his death he was uh, one of the obituaries published um, in a uh, weather bureau publication in 1916 uh, he was credited with having um, having prepared um, 22 of the uh, first 60 issues now none of those issues had uh, had attribution given to them in terms of uh, who was editor or preparer of it it was and we get into this in detail in the article about um, uh, who who were the uh, the personnel who prepared it essentially they were the indications officers at the time indications was the term that the signal service used at that time for forecasts so the officials who were preparing the daily forecasts uh, for a given month were also had the responsibility of preparing some of the publications including monthly weather review and um, Eventually, um, there were individual editors assigned, and Abby uh, took on the role, the formal role as editor in 1893, and remained in that position until 1909, when uh, when he was actually uh, demoted uh, by the uh, the chief of the bureau, uh, Willis Moore, uh, having to do with a, a controversy in, uh, involving um, the establishment of an observatory in Mount Weather. Uh, Virginia and the Blue Ridge Mountains. Uh, so he was removed as, as sort of as part of that um, um, demotion. His, his salary was reduced. Uh, he was removed from his post as editor, uh, um, and he was actually shipped off to uh, to Mount Weather and and spent a, about a year there, where he was put in charge of a uh, a new um, and and short lived uh, journal that the Weather Bureau was uh, publishing called Bulletin of the Mount Weather Observatory, which was where they were going to be publishing their more technical papers. Um, and, and Monthly Weather Review at that time kind of took a, a turn as one of uh, Corzine's um, data periods that he referred to that, that, that Dave mentioned, where it took on um, uh, less of a technical role and, and had less of a, uh, of, of a narrative um, flair, if you will, that Abby really added to it. So to kind of um, back up a little bit, while he was uh, in charge of the um, of the the journal, he really did uh, do a lot to to take it from just a, a collection, a summary of uh, climatological events and and data, and really turn it into a scientific journal. He uh, he solicited contributions from a wide range of potential authors, including uh, some who were well outside 
the field of meteorology, um, including um, the Wright brothers. Uh, he corresponded with them uh, during their instrumental uh, experiments. Uh, and, uh, and also, uh, there were some individuals, there's documentation that he solicited articles from uh, Booker T. Washington and even uh, Theodore Roosevelt, who at the time was serving as civil service commissioner. And there, were, if you look in the early uh, issues of Monthly Weather Re Review, you'll see some articles and notes about uh, be, uh, the civil service uh, commission and having to do with sort of the logistics of uh, either applying for or getting promoted within the Weather Bureau. And so I, I believe that may be what he was soliciting from, uh, from Roosevelt, who incidentally, just as a, as a little piece of trivial aside, who grew up just down the street from the Abbey home in uh, in Lower Manhattan, uh, about 20 years apart uh, in terms of uh, those two individuals. Alexander Graham Bell, another one uh, individual whom Abby uh, knew and uh, corresponded with and, and uh, w moved in the same scientific circles in Washington. Uh, and uh, he had contributed some uh, material to Monthly Weather Review. And, uh, and it was uh, a later editor, Alfred J. Henry, who in 1929 uh, wrote in Monthly Weather Review as some of his recollections of the history uh, credited Abby, quote, more than any other person, it said it was due to him more than any other person that the publication reached its high standing as a meteorological journal. Okay, let's uh, go on to the next slide, Dave. And, Almost from the beginning, uh, monthly weather reviews became noticed both within the larger scientific community and in the, the popular uh, press at the time. In fact, the Chicago Daily Tribune uh, published or reprinted in its entirety uh, the entire February 1873 issue, which again, uh, was uh, these were only one page summaries. So we're only talking about maybe about uh, 500 words total. Uh, and uh, they had that uh, reprinted, and the, around the same time, the Knoxville uh, Daily Press and Herald, in its uh, March 19, 1873 edition, uh, referred to the uh, Monthly Weather Review and some of the other publications of the Signal Service and the advantage that these reports had and the interest manifested uh, by them. Um, and then there's this interesting uh, journal that uh, that we found called uh, the Re the Republic that in um, June 1874, actually re uh, referring to a, a change that uh, Monthly Weather Review had undergone around that time. So it, it referred to a, a previous month's um, issue of Monthly Weather Review. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, that's the, the next one, the science uh, in 1883 referred to uh, a previous month's issue of, uh, I believe it was November 1882, as an improvement over any of its uh, predecessors. But this uh, this other journal, The Republic, in June 1874, uh, said that all the great meteorological data necessary for a scientific study of American climatology and the development of agriculture and sanitary meteorology, what we today would probably refer to as biometeorology, uh, was contained in this journal. And so it, it developed a very large readership. Um, copies were, were shared among uh, the volunteer observers at the, in, in the Signal Service and the Weather Bureau, other libraries. Um, and it really developed a reputation as a prominent scientific journal uh, of its time uh, devoted to meteorology. And as you might imagine, there was a large demand for back issues despite printing thousands of and distributing thousands of copies each month. And this led to these notes by the editor, which at the time, the, the, uh, the three examples given here, this would have been uh, under Abby's editorship, where they actually had to, uh, to print little notices um, reminding people to preserve their sets in good order and offer them to libraries and secondhand book dealers if, if uh, individuals did not wish to retain them for their own use. And, 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 that they, and that they in the Signal Service or Weather Bureau, actually at this time it uh, would have been the Weather Bureau, um, have received an un large, unusually large number of requests for copies of Monthly Weather Review and, un and other publications. And it's difficult, if not impossible, to fulfill all these requests. And so, uh, so they were almost making a plea, if you will, to the, the readers to hold on to their issues. And if they had 
back issues that they didn't want even to send them back to the Weather Bureau to then, uh, then distribute on to others who were looking for some of these issues. So we'll jump ahead a little bit. Uh, in 1922, around the 1922, 1923, Monthly Weather Review turns, uh, turned 50 years old. And um, Charles Marvin, the uh, chief of the Weather Bureau at the time, in his annual report uh, for 1922, wrote a brief um, summary of how the journal was, was regarded at the time. And as you see here, he says that it, it serves as an important aid, among other things, an important aid in the teaching of meteorology in primary and secondary schools, and also an exchange also as a medium of exchange for workers in the field of theoretical as well as applied meteorology. And, and those are two things that, uh, um, that Abby deserves a lot of credit for in terms of um, uh, both uh, helping use the, uh, the journal as a teaching and outreach tool. He um, was very adamant in terms of uh, promoting meteorology, both in, uh, in primary and secondary schools, but also at the, um, post-secondary and graduate level and actually was instrumental in helping create the first graduate program in meteorology at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, he corresponded with people, I mentioned uh, Booker T. Washington at the Tuskegee Institute, offered to send him copies of the journal uh, as, a, as a teaching and outreach uh, uh, tool there. So, uh, and, then, and then worked uh, also to help um, infuse a lot of, of research uh, that was taking place at that time in theoretical meteorology, which I think is a good segue into the next slide uh, that talks about some of the material published and a lot of it well after Abby's tenure, in fact, after his death, um, relating to the uh, the Bergen School methods of synoptic analysis, um, of course, the uh, polar front theory of Wilhelm Birkness and, and his cadre of, um, of researchers in Norway uh, and, and so here are just a, a, a few of the things that were uh, that were published around that time, including um, Anne Louise Beck. The second from the bottom there is is one of particular interest, uh, and that's a, a very interesting story in and of itself. Um, she uh, was a college student in, in California who received a fellowship to go study and at the Bergen School in Norway and. Uh, and came back and uh, and had published a paper, one of the few women at the time who had published something in Monthly Weather Review. Um, and we talk a little bit about that in the paper as well. All right. So uh, as Dave mentioned in the chart showing how the, uh, uh, the pages and sort of the, the success of the journal, if you will, ebbed and flowed over the years, alluded to the post-war, post-World War II period. And there's an interesting, um, there's an interesting reference to Monthly Weather Review that comes from this 1953 Department of Commerce Advisory Committee, Advisory Committee and Weather Services actually report that referred to uh, Monthly Weather Review never having regained the stature it enjoyed before 1940, uh, saying that it was well-edited, high quality type of publication on the subject, um, but really talked about uh, the need for some changes to take place and, and uh, in order to bring back uh, the, um, the stature that it once uh, enjoyed prior to the start of World War II when uh, budgetary constraints and, um, and the redirection of, of pers personnel and other resources uh, led to a, a decline in the number and uh, of um, articles published. And so I think, uh, Dave, maybe that's a good uh, point to hand it back over to you and talk about uh, how we get into the more modern era of the journal. So as I mentioned before, the, um, the NOAA was under pressure to cut its budget. Uh, they approached uh, the American Meteorological Society to take a monthly weather review over and, and the society debated it and, and we've seen some of the paperwork of, of this discussion and the contracts that went on um, during this transfer and uh, are in the archives. And the AMS was worried about the, um, about the transfer for, for two reasons. One was whether it would duplicate the other journals that, that they were publishing at the time, which included the Journal of Applied Meteorology and um, the Journal of Atmospheric Science. And they also worried whether they could succeed 
in making uh, it, it pay for its, its own way um, within the three-year period um, during which NOAA was going to subsidize the AMS to develop it, uh, and then they would, um, they, would, they would stop paying that after three years. And um, they eventually resolved these issues. Uh, the first issue was resolved um, by kind of redirecting, uh, redefining what monthly weather review would be and what JAM would be. Uh, monthly weather review would be developed as a vehicle for the publication of articles on um, meteorological topics of weather forecasting, observations and instrumentation in the Journal of Applied Meteorology would be directed to the application of atmospheric sciences and of meteorological information to problems where this information is critically important but not sufficient for optimal solutions, whatever that is supposed to mean. Now, um, they solved the second problem uh, in a relatively simple way. In, in 1973, if you were a member of the AMS, of course, you got your subscription to the bulletin, but you also received one of the three technical journals as well, JAZZ, um, JAM, or the Journal of Physical Oceanography as part of your annual membership dues. And as the cost of publishing journals um, increased, what the AMS decided to do was take on monthly weather review, but not include that as um, one of those free journals. Now, eventually, um, and I don't know the exact year, that um, that offer was stopped and then all you got was, was the bulletin. So um, both of those conditions were met, the AMS agreed, um, and as you saw from the previous um, chart, it, it took off and the first uh, chief editor was uh, Chester Newton and his assistant was his wife, Harriet Roadbush Newton. The next, and, and a, while it was under the AMS, it, it kind of stayed steady from the 70s and 80s and into the early 90s. But as the publishing world started to change, monthly weather review started to change. And, and of course, all the AMS journals started to change. The first thing was the um, electronic submission of manuscripts online. And uh, you no longer had to submit five hard copies, uh, bind them up at, and spend all afternoon at the photocopier, bind these things up and, and send them off to the um, chief editor to be sent to um, the peer reviewers. The speed of the publication process was also accelerated during this time, not only in the peer review process, but also in production. Uh, Dave Jorgensen and the Publications Commission and the AMS staff really worked hard to get the color figures down from uh, quite expensive costs, as much as 1,600 pounds per page, down to zero. Um, and it was pretty remarkable how they were able to do that. Again, we go through this in, uh, in, in our article. Um, of course, there's the introduction of the PDFs online and, and that consisted of several different phases. Obviously we had to um, scan in the archive and, and NOAA had a big um, contribution to, to that. And then of course there were the archives from the AMS era. But then after 1997, when production became digital, um, the, the end result was, was already a, a PDF. And so that made that quite simple. And then um, in the time that I've been chief editor, I've been increasing the number of editors due in part to an increase in submissions, but also to reduce editor workload. When, um, when I started as an editor in 2004, I was handling as much as 50, 60 manuscripts a year. Dave Jorgensen, when he was chief editor, was handling 70 or 80 manuscripts a year. And now um, because of the large number of editors, um, we're, we're able to better distribute that and, and we have more sensible workloads of between 20, 30, maybe, maybe 40 manuscripts a year. Now, the evolution of monthly weather review is in the other AMS journals is not over. One of the things that we will be working on is to go full Harry Potter on you and deliver embedded videos and animations in your PDF. So you'll be able to look on, uh, 
look in your PDF and, and see these things be animated, just like the newspapers in Harry Potter. Right, so let's talk about some cool things published by Monthly Weather Review. There were literally hundreds of things that we wanted to write about, and, and the paper was already horrendously long enough. So uh, Sean, Sean's going to take you through some of the cool things that we public that we saw published in Monthly Weather Review over the years. And speaking of cool, the first one is Sean. <laughs> is uh yes wilson bentley's photographs of snow and ice crystals and frost uh as many of you know wilson bentley from jericho uh vermont was a, a meteorologist who um who had a passion let's say for uh for photography especially micro photography and had this uh, very uh, elaborate especially for that time uh homemade um uh, apparatus that consisted of a, of a large format view camera and a microscope attachment and this whole um, this whole system of gathering the snow crystals, preparing them, uh, putting them in, on uh, glass plates or slides and then photographing them. And, um, and, and Abby became aware of this and uh, as did others and corresponded with, uh, with Bentley and, uh, and asked him to contribute some of his uh, some of his photographs to Monthly Weather Review, and um, and let's see, this was um, Dave. Do you know what year this? This was the was? 1902 issue. 1902 issues, and so if you go back and look at those issues, there are these incredible full-page um, um, plates, if you will, these these uh, leaves that are. Um, I, I've seen I've seen some of the originals in the NOAA library, and you can tell they're different. They're a harder. I believe somewhat glossier or at least thicker uh, paper stock that have, and I know Dave, you've got some in your your personal collection, so you've probably experienced this as well. And just to be able to, to touch that, hold them, and think, you know, these aren't necessarily the original um, photographs, but these are about as close as you and I will ever get to perhaps um, some of the original uh, prints that uh, that Bentley created. So this is one of the cooler things I think uh, that um, that ended up in the pages of Monthly Weather Review, and it's still very. Uh, very much of interest today. Uh, Dave, do you want to talk about the next uh, slide? Yeah. Um, one of the things that we think about, you know, sitting here in the modern era was, you know, oh, it must have been, um, you know, horrible not having observations around uh, the world and transmitting this information. Yet, when you go into the archives, you can find hemispheric maps of the monthly average sea surface uh, or monthly average temperature, uh, sea level pressure, and winds. This one is for October 1878, and you can see that it extends <laughs> over most of the mid latitudes um, around the hemisphere. Again, of course, we don't know the quality of of these and how many stations went into them necessarily, but um, extremely remarkable charts and and uh again if, if if we just wanted to elaborate more and more in this article um we, we could have gone on and on and on about um all the different types of charts that were published over the years at the end of these monthly issues sean yep yeah and uh speaking of charts uh this is uh this is one of my favorites uh it, it was just start by saying that uh, especially uh, beginning around the turn of the 20th century, and this is from um, from 1900, um, the uh, Monthly Weather Review served as what you might call the meteorological chronicle of record of some of the most extreme and historic weather events affecting the United States, including such um, uh, such great events that many of us are familiar with or have heard of as the, the blizzard of 1888, um, the 1922 Knickerbocker storm that uh, affected Washington, D.C., the, the tri-state tornado of 1925, the 1935 Labor Day hurricane, and, uh, and then this one, which is the 1900 Galveston hurricane. And this is one of, of a series of uh, surface maps that were uh, included in the September 1900 issue um, that show uh, the hurricane as it was uh, uh, making landfall um, in Galveston, and of course uh, resulting in um, in, one, in the greatest uh, number of uh, deaths attributed to uh, uh, any, I believe, any natural disaster in the United States. 
uh, at least. And of course, the, the story of Isaac Klein is very much uh, intertwined with this. And there's a short um, contribution by Klein in this very issue. And um, and I think uh, some of this uh, that that report and and some of the um, the charts here uh, were um, were inspirational um, to Eric Larson when he wrote his book Isaac Storm. In fact, I believe in the um, the end papers and the, the the what you see when you open up his book, and at least in the the edition that I have, uh, has one of the the charts from Monthly Weather Review in there, or maybe it's a similar one that was published elsewhere that basically shows the inundation from the storm surge and what parts of Galveston were were flooded and which parts were, and that's another um, um, map that was included in this series. And so, um, so most of many of these early uh, weather uh, disasters and historic uh, weather events uh, had not only a, a very uh, strong narrative um, component uh, published in Monthly Weather Review, but also a graphical component as well. And especially if you look at uh, at it's McDonald 1935 is the the reference for the 19 uh, Labor Day 1935 hurricane. Um, there, that's uh, one of the most extensive um, articles, especially of its time, uh, analyzing a synoptic event. I believe, correct, Dave? Hmm. Right. And uh, <laughs> you know, just this this story never seems to end, and and even. Earlier this week, we were still editing the manuscript, and you know the reason why. Um, you know, Dr. Manabi's work, 17 papers he published over the years in Monthly Weather Review, and as far as I can tell, that that probably makes uh, the first uh, Nobel Prize laureate to um, be writing papers in, in our journal. And then just to kind of close on a silly note, in uh, 1902, Monthly Weather Review published an article on yellow snow in Michigan, and uh, that was tinted yellow by the Loess, which is a fine clay. It was picked up by a, a windstorm that passed through uh, Wisconsin and Iowa and then um, caused the dust to be uh, transported across Lake Michigan and then deposited with this relatively light snowfall. Now, it took 72 years later when Zappa 1974, which was uh, unfortunately not published in, in Monthly Weather Review, advised us not to eat the yellow snow, although he had a very different explanation uh, for that. So that brings us to the close of our presentation. I want to, since we're here at the invitation of the NOAA Library, I really want to th give special thanks to them and the archivists who made this work possible. There's no way that um, we could have done this if it hadn't been for the um, digital imaging project, for Dee Clarkin, who provided um, high resolution scans of um, early issues, Stacy and Laura in Boulder, and then Sophie at the AMS. And speaking of the AMS and, and uh, the archivists there, um, this talk is dedicated to the late uh, Ginny Nathan. Again, not necessarily for this particular project, but she has been so helpful to me over the years in accessing historical documents that were not available online um, and helping out with other requests over the years. So there's the uh, cover page of what we submitted earlier this week. It'll be uh, in libraries, newsstands online, and other places, as they say, where fine meteorological journals are found in uh, the first issue of next year. And you can follow us uh, on Twitter. So now is the fun part of the talk. If you have your phone or you're on your computer, if you can open up a web browser and go to kahoot.it. And this is where we will play the game, kahoot.it, K-A-H-O-O-T dot I-T. And I will be now switching screens if everything goes right here to my browser where we will be running this show. Indeed. Excellent. This seems to be working 
So what we need you to do then is uh, enter this code at the top, 507-7834. And you can put your real name in there. You can put in your pseudonym. And once we get uh, everyone in, we will start the questions. And the uh, there, there's 10 questions. They multiple choice, and I'll explain how that works shortly. The snowflake Bentley has joined us. All right. Well, so is yellow snowflake too. Okay, give it another 20 seconds or so. And You're I'm running a little bit behind. I think the pin number will be displayed as we play the game, so you can always join in late. And I'm going to hop in here real quickly uh, and let everyone know we will be uh, taking questions at the end of the game, uh, depending how much time we have. So if you do have a question about uh, the presentation or anything, place that in the question panel, and we will get to that. Um, as we have time at the end. And if we don't answer that uh, during the seminar, I will send these uh, questions on to Dave and Sean and they can get back to you via email. Great, thanks Katie. Let's get started. Okay, so here's some ground rules to, to get started here. If you've never used Kahoot, what you're gonna do is answer the question correctly in the shortest possible time. So on your phone or your computer, you're gonna see uh, four different boxes, four different uh, shapes, four different colors. Um, and that's where you will click or uh, select your intended answer. So each one of these um, questions are multiple choice with four possible answers. So click the color or the shape that goes with the answer you wanna go with. Okay, so here's question number one. In 1878, Monthly Weather View experimented with translating the journal into another language. What was the language? So there were actually a foreign language translation of this journal. Which language was it? It was French. German was a good choice, but it was French. And who's at the top but Yellow Snowflake. And here's the announcement uh, that, that came several years later where someone, Naughty Naughty, took the copy of the French edition from the Library of the Weather Bureau and they would like it back. Um, we have been unable to find <laughs> one of these French editions of Monthly Weather it, Review. Let us know. Yeah, it's really valuable. Let us know. Send it back to the library. They, they on eBay. All right. In February 1898, Monthly Weather Review published an article advocating for the formation of this society, which was founded 21 years later. 21 years ahead of its time, Monthly Weather Review was advocating for the formation of this society. That's the American Meteorological Society. Good job, everybody. And Greg at the top. And there's the announcement from the February 1898 issue and American Meteorological Society. So lowercase <laughs> Meteorological Society. and. That's the name that eventually took on. In what year were the first monthly mean upper air charts published in Monthly Weather Review? The first monthly mean upper air charts published in Monthly Weather Review.
All right, 1903. Congratulations to the four people that got that one right. Lightning Queen at the top. And here is the monthly mean isobars and isotherms at 10,000 feet across the US in January 1903. Not pulling your leg on that one. All right, question number four. The Wright brothers used monthly weather reviews tables of average wind speeds to select the location for their first flight. Where was this first flight? Kitty Hawk, good job, everybody. And how has that changed the score? Ah, NCEI guy, nice. Here's the next question. The April 1915 issue of Monthly Weather Review published the first derivation and solution to this equation. What's this equation called? What is this differential equation called? Ooh, wow. One person knew their partial differential equations and names, the bateman burgers equation. I made up Euler-Lagrange equation. I can't believe people fell for that one. Okay, not much change at the top. <laughs> Here we go. Next one. In 1935, the Weather Bureau had nearly 5,000 observers. How many of these 5,000 observers were women? And this is one of those women there out there taking her measurements at her station. I think this is the one that had, I can't remember her name, 49 years of observer experience. 300 was the right answer. And how has that changed? And CEI guy still at the top. Here we go, next question. The first weather satellite, Tyros-1, was launched on April 1st, 1960. In what issue did Monthly Weather Review publish the first imagery from Tyros-1? So, launched April 1st, 1960. No one uh, picked March 1960. Uh, we, we talked about this and, and I figured it was a trick question, but indeed, Monthly Weather Review published its first image before <laughs> the event actually happened. All right, since no one got that one right, here it is. So here's the trick, that monthly weather review was always compiled after the month was over. So here you can see this is the March 1960 issue. Here's Fritz and Wexler uh, talking about the cloud pictures from uh, the satellite. And you can see here the issue closed May 15th, 1960, and was issued June 15th. And so they were able to get a satellite that was launched in April into the March issue. That's how important I'll, I'll it was. I'll add briefly, Dave, that's also how Monthly Weather Review could publish about the Wright Brothers' first flight in its December 1903 issue, uh, which I think came out in February 1904. There's a nice write-up there called that we discussed called, uh, called Meteorology and the Art of Flying. Excellent. Here we go. Next question. The most highly cited article in Monthly Weather Review is from 1963 and is 66 pages long. Who was the author? It's a 1963 article and it's 66 pages long. Okay, it's Smagarinsky. Smagarinsky, uh, also working with Manabi uh, on several other highly cited monthly weather review papers, but this is the paper, uh, Greg's at the top. Good job, Greg. And 
general circulation experiments with the primitive equations, the basic experiment by Smagorinsky in March 1963. Here we go. Until 1972, it was free to publish in Monthly Weather Review. NOAA then requested a per page payment from the author's affiliation. How much was this? How much were the page charges in 1972? I want to chime in, Dave, and let everyone know if they are just full on guessing, that is what I am doing. And <laughs> it is a ton of fun. <laughs> There you go. It's actually $40, which is about, was it $260 in, in modern money? So uh, the present $125 per page rate at AMS is a steal relative to inflation. And how has that changed things? NCEI guy, top of the board. Are you guys bringing it's, back that per page count for the 150th? <laughs> So in 2003, a proposal was floated for a new journal that would have killed Monthly Weather Review. What was the name, proposed name of this journal? 2003, we almost lost Monthly Weather Review and, and well, for that matter, all the other AMS journals. What would this journal have been called? The Journal of the American Meteorological Society. Most people got that one right. And there you go. It was written by Dave Randall and Carrie Emanuel, a proposal to combine all the AMS journals into a single journal because of the transition to digital publications made this possible. All right, so here we go. That was the last question. Here's the podium, top three. Number three, Greg. Good job, Greg. Number two, Yellow Snowflake. And number one, I think we know who that is, is it? NCEI Guy, congratulations. Sean, do we have any prizes for our winners? Yes, Dave, our winners will receive <laughs> a lifetime subscription to Monthly Weather Review, courtesy of the current chief editor. No, not uh, I, I can give those things out, but <laughs> anyway, get in contact with us, we'll figure out something. Good, good anyway, writing. That's it, your, back, your back to you. <laughs> Back to you, Katie. Thanks for thanks for having us. Hope you enjoyed the <laughs> talk you. and the game. Yes, thank you so much, Dave and Sean. That was highly entertaining to end on. Um, if you have a question, please pop those in uh, to the question panel. Um, if you have a question about the the timeline of monthly weather review or any other interesting tidbits that came out of their uh, their research into its history. Please place those in the question panels. Uh, we do have a comment. Thank you, David and Sean. Excellent chronicling. Chronicling. Oh, I'm gonna stumble over this word too. Chronicling of this tremendously impactful publication. So, some great kudos there. But I am not seeing any questions. So, if you do have a question, you can follow or find. Uh, Dave and Sean here on their emails. Uh, thank you so much for the, this presentation, Dave and Sean. This was um, wonderful. I will remind everyone that we did record it. So if you missed it or if you would like to uh, trick your fellows with some questions and answers, uh, send them to the library's YouTube channel where we will have this posted. Thank you all for joining us. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Uh, stay healthy and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you.